There's a popular idea about accepting hypotheses in science. It's called Occam's razor. It's also called the principle of parsimony, which means stinginess. If two hypotheses explain observations, the one which needs the least assumptions and the least special conditions is assumed to be the better of the two options. Recently, I asked, how do scientists know that the Earth goes round the sun? Brett gave the answer. By Kepler's laws and stellar parallax. And why do we accept Kepler's laws? Because of Occam's razor. The outstanding observational astronomer Tycho Brahe made astronomical measurements ten times more accurate than any made before him. He said his observations show that the Earth is at the centre of the universe. The sun and moon go around the Earth and everything else goes around the sun. He said the Bible confirms this, so he was confident it was the correct model. Brahe hired Kepler to analyse his observations. He told Kepler to put his findings within the framework of this model, and Kepler agreed. But Brahe died, and Kepler decided that the model put forward by Aristarchus of Samos and resurrected by Nicholas Copernicus was simpler. Everything goes round the sun, including the Earth, which is just another planet. That theory requires the sun to be stationary. The planets go round the sun in elliptical orbits, and the moons of the planets go around them in elliptical orbits. Brahe's model required the Earth to be stationary, the sun and moon to go around it in elliptical orbits, the planets to go around the sun in elliptical orbits, and the moons to go around their planets in elliptical orbits. Occam's razor was definitely in favour of Kepler. There were only two levels of everything going round in elliptical orbits, whereas Brahe's had three levels. And as well as that, the sun was bigger and more massive than the Earth, so it made sense that it should be the central body. So, Kepler reneged on his undertaking to Brahe and ended up with the sun in the centre of the universe and the Earth as a planet going round the sun like the rest of the planets. Kepler's laws were accepted as standing on solid rock. But then, Arago performed experiments which showed the Earth to be not moving. George Biddle Airy did another experiment which showed the same thing. So did Mascar, Lord Rayleigh, Theodore de Coudre, Truton and Noble, Michelson and Morley, and Thorndike and Kennedy. Most of the scientists of the world were so confident that the Earth must travel round the Sun that they explained the observations away with ad hoc hypotheses, or they ignored them. But Michelson and Morley was particularly shocking for the scientists of the world, because Michelson was the top experimental physicist. His work was not so easy to dismiss. And as G. Allen Colley noted, this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. Only with respect to the Earth would the speed of light be c as predicted by Maxwell's equations. This is tantamount to assuming that the Earth is the central body of the universe. And that was such an unwelcome prospect for the scientific community that they searched for ways to explain it away, as they had done for all the previous experiments which had shown the Earth to be stationary. Lorentz came up with a theory which was based on properties of the ether. It seemed successful for a while, but it couldn't explain away the experiment by Kennedy and Thorndike. Then Einstein put forward a complex and non-intuitive modification to Lorentz's theory, 
which explained away Michelson's results by denying the existence of the universally accepted fabric of space, generally known as the ether. This ether formed the basis of such important scientific standards as Maxwell's equations. Einstein's theory is so unreasonable that a United States presidential advisor on science noted, after one course on relativity, all further straight thinking becomes impossible. Harold Nordenson, a member of the Swedish Academy of Science, which distributes the Nobel Prize for Physics, said, Relativity is not physics, but philosophy, and in my opinion, poor philosophy. I think we can agree with that. Stipulating how light should behave on the grounds of Einstein's own free will is not physics, and if it's philosophy, it's poor philosophy. Using the Lorentz transformation from a theory where it's justified by the ether, but after banishing the ether, it becomes just a fiddle factor, not physics, and if it's philosophy, it's poor philosophy. Now, in light of all this, wouldn't it be a good idea to reconsider how the Brahe and Kepler models now fare in the light of Occam's razor? Brahe's model requires three layers of ellipses moving round a centre. Kepler's requires only two. Brahe's model keeps the long-established ether intact. Kepler requires the ether to be banished, in spite of the fact that experiments like those of Sagnac and Michelson and Gale confirm its existence. Brahe's model requires simple, easily understood mathematics. Kepler's model requires Einstein's abstruse mathematics, with time and space being plastic and variable and depending on the movement of an observer. Brahe's model leaves space and time, the fundamental foundations of physics, unchanged. Kepler's model has traditionally been dependent on Newton's assumption that some hypothetical components of the universe like the solar system, can be removed from the universe and considered separately, independent of the rest of the universe. Brahe's model depends on a theory of gravity which considers the whole universe, in which the mass of all the material in the universe produces a gravitational field. The sun is so small in comparison with all the mass of the entire universe that it's negligible. So, in summary, Brahe's model needs one more layer of very straightforward rotations. Both theories need a theory of gravity of which Brahe's is at least as reasonable as Kepler's. Kepler's needs the abstruse and unreasonable theory of relativity, with its distortion of space and time, which are the fundamental foundations of physics. It needs unreasonable and non-intuitive definitions of how light behaves and mathematics which is baffling, even unintelligible, to outside observers, and which isn't physics anyway, but second-rate philosophy. And finally, a number of eminent scientists have done experiments that show the Earth is not moving. I think any reasonable person would say that Occam's razor would now cut out Kepler from consideration. Accepting Occam's razor would have a drastic effect on everything the astronomers have been telling us. Parallax, for example. Astronomers take photographs of stars six months apart and assume that the Earth has gone halfway round the Sun a distance of about 180 million miles. The displacement of stars in the photographs are thought to indicate how far away they are. If the Earth is not going round the Sun, then those photographs would mean something completely different. Several space telescopes have looked for stellar parallax, but they are plagued by anomalies. 
the distance which used to be claimed before space telescopes to the star Alpha Centauri was six and a half light years. Now it's stated to be four point three six seven light years. Substantially different. But the differences from one space telescope to another are also substantial. In a paper by Howard Bond, et al., we hear of the parallax for Polaris being 10, 7.54, and 6.26 milliarc seconds, depending on which telescope was used. Now, those telescopes are in orbit at different heights. If we were actually travelling around the Sun, then the height of the telescope's orbit would not matter. It would be minuscule compared to the 180 million miles they're supposed to be apart when the photographs were taken. If the Earth is not moving, then those differences in orbit heights would make a significant difference. The astronomers dream up all sorts of excuses for those significant differences. And any dream will do, except that the Earth is not orbiting the Sun. But if astronomers acknowledged this, they would have to revise their thinking about the universe. They might have to accept the possibility that they had been considering a model of the universe which is completely wrong. And there's overwhelming evidence that the standard model, the Big Bang, is wrong. It was pointed out in Nature in 1989 that it's thoroughly unsatisfactory, and in 1995 that it's nonsense. It's surprising that it lasted another 30 years before the James Webb results put what should be the final nail in its coffin. Surely it's time to take seriously the model which we looked at in episodes 44 to 49. The model which explains many observations which the Big Bang can't. The model which God dictated to Moses in Genesis chapter 1. And perhaps as well as honestly applying Occam's razor, the astronomers should consider what God says in Isaiah 55 verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.